a wonderful pleasure this afternoon of introducing Dr. Daspal Singh to the group. Um, Dr. Singh's uh, uh, CV would take you probably another hour to work through all the highlights and accolades of what he's been able to accomplish over the course of his career thus far. So I'll hit some uh, some some very uh, cursory highlights um, for uh, the Buckeyes in the crowd. Uh, you'll have to excuse Dr. Singh. Uh, he was at the University of Michigan for his undergrad, uh, finally which he went to University of Illinois Chicago. He completed medical school uh, as their most outstanding graduate. Uh, following this, he went on to complete internal medicine residency at University of Rochester and then started making his way closer to Charlotte, uh, it, which is um, wonderful for those of us who have benefited uh, from his move uh, slowly this direction. Uh, he completed his pulmonary critical care fellowship at Duke, obtaining uh, a couple additional master's degrees uh, through uh, Duke as well. And I'm sure uh, he might uh, touch on a, a bit of that today as it kind of stems into uh, some of the um, some of the area of practice where I've interacted with Dr. Singh the most. And that is really through his work uh, and his um, passion around both uh, medical education uh, and in uh, quality improvement uh, and uh, performance improvement. Um, he is, I, I think everybody would agree, uh, one of uh, the uh, nations is not world's experts when it comes to um, ICU liberation and work around uh, ICU quality. Um, he uh, has worked extensively with our virtual critical care group here uh, and remains uh, the medical uh, director with our uh, critical care network, uh, really uh, championing um, uh, practice, education, uh, and quality improvement with that group as well. So when we were looking for speakers that are maybe outside of a typical uh, trauma group, uh, Dr. Singh always comes up at the, the top of your list. If you've had the pleasure of listening to him before, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but today uh, we have asked him to speak specifically on IC liberation, uh, but uh, more so as it's a little tailored to the trauma population and some of the challenges we've been experiencing uh, during COVID-19. So uh, Dr. Singh, without additional delay, I will turn it over to you and thank you for being here today. Uh, thanks, thanks, Kyle. Thanks, uh, Scott, for the very nice introduction and a chance for me to speak. Actually, I appreciate this uh, opportunity. So, a couple of uh, can you all see my screen? I assume the ice liberation screen. I have a couple of screens open, so um, make sure I have the PowerPoint open. Uh, if I don't, let me know. Um, a couple of disclosures. I do have a couple of financial disclosures. I am on an advisory board and on uh, and then part of the Levine Cancer Institute, AstraZeneca. A sponsor for our institution. I'm not a surgeon, so I will do my best to talk about trauma. Um, references are many. I'm not going to have time to go through a, a bunch of these, but if you're curious, uh, the Society of Critical Care Medicine did publish the IC Liberation textbook. It's a, it's a thin textbook uh, if you're interested. Uh, I was fortunate to be one of the co-editors of this, but it has a lot of the sort of seminal articles related to IC Liberation in this text. Um, so we'll talk about the ICU liberation work, and in thinking about this talk, I thought about what's different, actually, and obviously the pandemic is different. So uh, Dr. Evans and a few others asked me to sort of talk about liberation, but also sprinkle in some of the things that we're seeing in the COVID-19 population and how that's affecting what we're doing in relation to not just ICU, liber ICU care, but liberation, but also in the trauma population, what things we might see, uh, and what we're seeing in the medical world as well. So just a kind of a brief update uh, for those who don't know, the IC liberation is, is the newer term for the A through F bundle. You may have heard that term, A to F bundle. I'm sure it's a Twitter handle, it's a Twitter uh, 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 sort of a spot spot tag or hashtag, whatever they call it. And uh, so you can call it hashtag A to F or hashtag IC liberation. And there's some back and forth uh, banter about which is a better uh, one. But this is what we're gonna call IC liberation now is the A through F, the A is sort of analgesia. Uh, it's um, sort of um, it's the idea of to assess, prevent, and manage pain. The pain people got here first as well, and they wanted to really spotlight their their focus on analgesia first, which is good. Um, B is confusing. It's actually not airway. It's uh, both SAT. Uh, a is not airway. A is, a is analgesia, and B is both SAT and SBT. The idea that you can do a spontaneous awakening trial and couple it with a breathing trial. And we'll talk about that. It sounds very simple, some of these concepts, but you'd be, it's, it's 2020 and we haven't really hit the, um, the, we haven't really hit a lot of our stride here. Um, C is choice of analgesia and sedation. And by which I mean choice, I mean actually limit your choices. I mean, let's go and let's not do the things we used to do when I was a resident and medical student and fellow. Stuff, some of the stuff we did back 20 years ago, I'm not sure I'm very proud of the stuff we did. Uh, including long-acting benzodiazepines and such, um, and the stuff that we oftentimes did to manage these patients, analgesia and sedation. 
Uh, delirium is the D, and that's uh, sort of the champion of the ISO liberation is Dr. Wes Ely, who many of you know is a phenomenal speaker. We had him in, we hosted him in Charlotte a couple of years ago, and uh, but he's basically uh, sort of the delirium champion. And they actually have a brain dysfunction center at Vanderbilt University looking at this idea of delirium and how it how it's involved in the ICU. And this has a huge role in the COVID nineteen pandemic, which is it's a, we'll talk about it a little bit. E is for early mobilization, also called, or E for exercise, and the idea of mobilizing our patient population has been something that's known for decades, but we're sort of finally starting to understand it better. And F is the family engagement piece, which if anyone's had a family member that they care for in the ICUs or in all, 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 of you, all of you at the bedside, you know this has changed completely. We started making a lot of headway here, and all of a sudden things are changing in the F bundle, and we'll kind of talk about that. There's a lot of controversy as to whether additional letters should be added, and pretty soon, I don't know if it'll be alphabet soup, uh, but the Society of Critical Care Medicine is trying to be very mindful of doing a little balance of, of more information, but make sure it's evidence-based and really vetted before we add more letters. So uh, for those who are in sleep experts that wanted to see the sleep part added, um, there was a proposal to add sleep. It's not been officially added yet uh, as an important separate letter. So we're kind of working through our, our way here. Um, atrium Health, I'll talk about Atrium Health. I, know my, I recognize many of you um, are at non-Atrium Health facilities, but the idea is what I really enjoyed uh, in my career is to understand, you know, when I was an intensivist at a, at a small hospital that Duke had just bought, that's one of the smaller hospitals, uh, and uh, my first job was a 24-hour intensivist sort of doing these really crazy shifts and night shifts and day shifts in the ICU. And I thought, you know, I had this perspective that the non-Duke ICU would somehow be really easy, and uh, and that was really stupid. Um, I did not realize how hard that population is in any ICU. And you start looking at the country, and you start thinking about where are most of the ICU beds in our in our in our country, and uh, and where the people are located, what the physician staffing looks like, what the nursing staffing looks like, and you realize that you know what, there's a lot of variants of very commonly things we should be common things we should be doing that people we, we aren't doing well. And so I kind of did a lot of my career kind of understanding that physician shortages, the intensivist shortages specifically, the nursing shortages, and how we're going to manage it. And part of that has to be doing some basic stuff well. And so I see liberation when uh, Julie Rotelsky was our CNS in charge of this. She came to me with this process of the ICE, of the of the um, ICU Liberation Committee looking for sites by which we could potentially pilot this program where we look at the A through F bundle in various ICUs. And we said, I said, this is perfect. Let's, let's see how it works in small to medium sized ICUs, mixed med surge ICUs. How's it work in surgical units versus non surgical units? We started ba basically developing some ideas of how this looks across, knowing that we have diverse needs. There's inconsistency at bed the bedside. There's staffing issues. There's ICU, you got to be right. It's time dependent. You got to have some data metrics to go by. And we started look, looking through this process a few years ago, but it's about five years now. Uh, the process started, um, knowing that we can't do it all, but we thought this was important. So we looked at this through Atrium Health with a few facilities, and now have made it a system-wide initiative. And the basic premise is that basically, um, it's not like how I trained. When I trained at one point, you know, the ICU, you know, you were the, the attending wrote the order. You were kind of like the man when you walked down the ICU, or woman, uh, when you walked in the ICU, you were the person everyone followed. But it's much more of a team based. And the term is now no longer, no longer multi, multidisciplinary, but interprofessional. The idea that the patient at the center and that's collaborative decision making. So that's part one, which in the trauma world, I think you guys do it better than a lot of the medical people do. Uh, you already understand this. You understand your roles. You understand your how to how to delegate. You understand who's got what area and how to potentially um, and some basic leadership training is mandatory in, in the trauma in, in the trauma and disaster preparation world. So you're, I think, a little bit ahead of the rest of the rest of the country. We'll talk about how trauma compares to other uh, units or surgical trauma units. And then you sort of, and then just bring a long story short, over a number of years, a number of different sites, about 80 different sites looked at their patient population in which they looked at the A through F bundle. Did patients get a certain amount of care? Uh, if they got a certain amount of care, percentage of care with the ICU liberation bundle, what that looked like. And so what that means is, did, did these sites that are in the ICU collaboration, uh, about 80 different ICUs across the country, and some actually, in, sorry, North America, and now added a few international as well, over 15,000 patients were analyzed, um, and uh, Brenda Pun led the study, uh, which was published in 2019 in Critical Care Medicine. But the idea that if you actually paid attention to mechanical ventilation, pain issues, a, um, choice of sedation, look at the sort of the outcomes that you got. 
mechanical ventilation sort of probability of mechanical ventilation dropped the more consistent you applied the isolation liberation bundle. Pain scores stayed the same, but there was some concern that if you mi minimized analgesia, minimized medications, pain scores would go way up. But in fact, we saw sort of fairly steady pain scores. Um, they did have some pain, more, more, some more pain, some pain, but you got an, an exchange, less delirium, less coma, less use of physical restraints. And for the administrators and others in the room, think about readmission rates went down, discharge to facility went down. And what we're looking at now is con cognitive psychomotor performance actually post ICU, which is getting a lot of a lot of attention now in the Thrive Initiative. The idea that, you know what, the once they survive survival of the ICU isn't isn't the goal here. Survival to basically have a reasonable quality of life and get back to a functional quality of life that you desire and deserve is what our goal is. It's not necessarily just the ICU admission. That's not enough for us anymore. And so we're getting greedy. So we really want this chance of people getting better back to their lives. And so if you look at the ICU liberation, just step back a little bit and think, why am I doing all this little nitpicky stuff on, on charting, the, charting the sedation scores, charting the pain scores, making do all this extra stuff that people are making us do? Step back and look, look at this and say, you know what? If this was a drug or a medication or a protocol, there's no doubt looking at these outcomes, to me at least, that the more you do it, the more intentionally you do it, the, the more a focus you put towards it, the better chance you have of recovery. And so this is kind of why we go, this is the sort of, sort of the why, the idea that this is dose responsive. And so what does it mean? Well, uh, we had to sort of pick an A, an A score. There's a bunch of different pain scales. We just happened to pick the CPOT or critical care pain observation score, because uh, it's kind of easy, kind of replicable. There's some things that we can do with it. And we basically have some protocols around this, and um, you all know how to um, calculate, how to look at pain. But what gets hard, though, is actually when patients are have both pain, but also awake and have analgesia, and you're not sure how much in the trauma world is due to surgical pain, uh, injury pain, and other kinds of pain issues. And so you start thinking about how to manage pain and how to quantify it. Um, it's important to think through this space. So we use a CPOT score as our main pain score that we chart and we ask the nurses to do this at least a couple of times, if not several times a shift, depending on uh, on how aggressive we want to be with this. Some institutions do the CPOT score for the nursing staff every two to three hours, uh, depends on the institution that you're at. Uh, we do, I think, once, once or twice a shift, depending on we've gone back and forth on this a little bit. And then the B is the SAT and, and SBT. The idea that you need, you kind of need both the SAT to determine a patient's need for intensive care um, mechanical ventilation. Both essentially rely on the patient's spontaneous trial. I mean, you don't want to really help them that much. You want them to really do things on their own. Both the SAT and the SBT rely on, an important point is, we sort of thought, you know, when I trained, you'd kind of like go in the ICU, you kind of figure out who's ready for trial of extubation. You kind of lick your thumb, hold it up in the air, check with the winds, and sort of see, well, I think so-and-so is ready. I think Mr. Smith is ready. And you may or may not be ready. You don't really know. There's not a sort of consistent daily rigor to doing this, a standardized assessment and a standardized process to this. And this is actually the case in probably still the majority of the country. Uh, if you look at rural America, this is still the issue that we're having when we were camered, in, camered into other places around the country. You can see this kind of happen live. There's really no systematic approach. And so being systematic about this, it actually does tremendously, just a tremendous amount of benefit. I'm not going to sort of belabor that. But you also have to be careful. You have to be, require coordination and communication. And what you realize is very quickly is once you start doing this systematically, that my schedule doesn't align with the nursing schedule, doesn't align with the nurse, the RT schedule. And all of us have different sort of schedules and workflows and practice expectations and such and different political pressures to kind of get the work done. And so we realize that actually it's easier said than done. And so coordination of care has been one of those things that we've been spending a lot of time thinking through. And I would, I'm kind of jealous of the trauma world a little bit because I think you guys do a better job with role definition and definement than we, I think we do in the medical ICU world, where it's kind of this heterogeneous glob of people rounding in the IC, medical ICU, where everyone kind of says stuff and kind of knows not really a systematic thing. There's a much more systematic rigor, I think, in most surgical trauma ICUs and more surgical ICUs than I think there are in the medical world. And I think that's a good thing. And I think we can learn from that. So how do you do the SBT? Well, you got to make sure the patient's awake enough, hemodynamically stable, and you got to make sure that certain criteria are there, that the respiratory status is stable or improving, 
And then the other factors, and in the trauma world, particularly the things that we're thinking about are, you know, intracranial pressure, um, sites, and and sort of areas of incisions, and how how much care there is in those. Uh, obviously, neural 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 and spinal injuries affect a lot of things. And um, but the idea is sort of making sure you're you're coordinated with with, with your logistics and coordination here. And so we almost hyper communicate now um, with regarding to our SBTs being done, and then. If the patient fails a safety screen, you got you wait, you clinically optimize them, and then we're trying to get people to document why they failed. And one of the things we learned actually really quickly was that people just kind of subjectively said somebody failed an SBT. Well, I want to know why. Go into that and actually not just don't tell me verbally, document in the chart so that the next morning, if I'm not if I'm not there, somebody knows why they failed. The person coming after you knows why they failed. And so communication, and then you're going to see, I'm going to put a lot of emphasis in the medical record because I don't think we do a good enough job with this. And I've been pressuring the medical systems, the large medical system to actually really help with this part. And if they fail the, the, the safety screen, just do it again the next day. Hopefully you've optimized them better. They just need more time. And the breathing trial, um, sort of some key elements of the breathing trial, obviously the safety screen, you got to make sure that they're ready for this. Um, you don't want to be doing a safety, uh, spontaneous breathing trial on a patient who's either on high frequency oscillation, on, on APRV modes, or modes that are potentially um, injurious or, high, or, or oxygenating poorly. So you just got to recognize that, be smart about it. So we actually had to put some uh, verbiage around this. Um, and then if you're not successful, know how to optimize success. Like one of the things we do is we use vitamin Lasix, you know, I mean, vitamin L is a sort of a vitamin in our world. And so we, we diarrhea like, like crazy in our ICUs now, hopefully that's become the norm now around the country is to sort of minimize lung volume, which is one of the things I think in the, I will say one thing in the surgical trauma ICU, when we see transfers out, one of the things we've noticed early on, not so much at Carolina's Medical Center, but when you look at large databases around the country, uh, volume status is probably one of the biggest uh, predictors of, of uh, inability to extubate or pass an SBT. Um, so we pay a lot of attention now to, to volume status and pulmonary edema specifically. Um, what's, uh, and I'll talk about the COVID part in this in a little bit. Um, the key definitions, um, I think when, my, when I was a trainee, I was fairly naive, and I thought the goal was always weaning. And I think that I like how the ice liberation said, you know what, weaning is like, we, weaning is, is a W is for wimps. Your goal is for liberation. You want to get that, pa that patient off the ventilator as early as opportune time. Weaning is for basically, if you're really, you, you're, you're stuck in a point where the lungs only limit you or some other thing, something else is limiting your ability to liberate. And so um, that's one of the things where I think the, liber the intentional goal is, no, we don't, we don't talk much about weaning anymore. We talk about liberation. Although I will say COVID-19 has changed this. So in COVID-19, a lot of our practices have changed quite a bit related to this because some of these patients with severe ARDS take a long time and they may or may not get better. So we're kind of back to sort of like um, doing a lot of weaning adjustments. And I'll tell you this month when I was in the ICU, I feel like I've weaned every day and I made very little progress on some of these patients. So we're learning back, we're kind of being humbled by this virus right now. Um, but the idea of the SBT is a time-tested, evidence-based process. So when I always hear, you always hear this once in a while, you hear someone say, well, so-and-so is not ready for an SBT. Great. I understand why. I want to know why. Because I want to know why we are not doing an SBT. Like not doing it and just saying someone's not ready is not good enough for me. I want to know exactly what it is. And I want to know what, what, what that is. And in COVID-19, what's particularly interesting is many of us are like, well, we kind of err on the side of, leaving someone on long, we may not do an SBT as much. We're not in the room as frequently. We're not, we're worried about failure. What if they fail an SBT this time? Or are we have to go back in with full PPE and get everything set with a patient all of a sudden, you know, with the horrible delirium that we're seeing in these patient populations, are we going to be able to manage the delirium without exposing ourselves or our patients to additional risk? So I think COVID-19 has changed a way, has heightened our attention to these processes and understanding our workflow better. Um, but it's it's been an adjustment, I would say. So the patient passes a safety screen. Uh, we basically put on minimal pressure support. You all know this. Uh, we have some minor variation. There's some sort of game we're playing right now with the PEEP between not making it five to eight so that we can make our numbers look better for Medicare reporting, but I'm not gonna get into that sort of weird political thing, but I think it's being done around the country now where everyone's kind of weaning to PEEP of eight. And then that way, apparently, you cannot get dinged for a VAP if you go up on the peep later. Uh, it's a strange game you're seeing around the country. But we're all doing it. 
Um, everyone's doing it. I'm not sure who's not doing it. If you're not doing it, you probably will be doing it just to kind of play these Medicare games. Um, and then you observe for failure, tachypnea or bradypnea. Um, obviously, you want to document. We want to document all these things. What what exactly is the reason for failure? So, patients on SBT, how long do you continue it? Um, there's some sort of thought uh, in our medical ICU world that 30 minutes is enough. Um, beyond an hour, it's not clear as how much value you really have. Um, our RTs are instructed to basically, once the patient passes an SBT, they can put them back on full support if they want to. If they don't think the, the excavation will happen soon, or they'll think they're ready, they'll go ahead and call the attending or the or the or the delegate or the or the or the, or the designee to go ahead and get an extubation order. And so we're kind of really trying to be very aggressive to this. Um, and so, um, but just FYI. Now with COVID-19, there's some chatter about doing a longer SBT. Um, why are we doing this? Well, kind of the reasons I mentioned is that we're kind of a little bit nervous about uh, some of these patients, patients with a horrible ARDS that we're seeing, the horrible delirium that we're seeing. We may actually do it a little bit longer than we, we may sort of make it harder for the patient to pass. And the reasons are mainly to do like related to uh, PPE, uncertainty of the physiology, a lot of our own discomfort about the patients, sort of what they've been through and how long they're taking to get through their journey. Um, and so it's a little bit more challenging. It's something that I thought I wouldn't be here thinking in 2020, we would I'd be kind of more wimpy than I had been. Um, so just something to think about in our COVID-19 population, when you have a COVID-19 trauma patient, um, I've been humbled by this virus. Um, and I think many of our colleagues would say the same thing is that uh, we're just seeing horrible injury, in it, lung injury, and it waxes and wanes. You may think it looks okay one day, it looks terrible the next day. You try diuresis, one day you succeed, next day you make things worse. And so it's been an interesting sort of journey as we go along this. Extubation. So the other part of it is extubation is considered an aerosol generating procedure. And so generally speaking, when this virus first hit, uh, the U.S., we were all, our fears were, you know, intubation, extub extubation. And we saw all of us were trying these hoods and special sort of equipment, um, suction carts, essentially, that would suck the air out of the, uh, except for the endotracheal tube. I mean, it was kind of an interesting, an in interesting exercise as we all kind of went through this process right now of understanding ex intubation and extubation, how much of this um, sort of process is um, potentially risk to the user or to, to, the, to the clinicians in the, in the room. Um, and so we thought at that time the virus was mostly transmitted by aerosol, although recent, recent I think there, recently the things, there's probably a combination of droplet and aerosol favoring more droplet, uh, which changes the, uh, the sort of precautions a little bit. Uh, but the idea is that extubation uh, was present, we were all kind of fearful of this. And so we made it where if you're going to extubate somebody, you have to be in full PPE for a COVID-19 patient. And so that obviously makes things a little bit more challenging logistically. Um, and if you're the whole team, I do a lot of virtual critical care. So a lot of tele-ICU. And in the tele-ICU world, it's interesting because people are afraid to go in. Um, they want to minimize the amount of contact we have with the patient, trying to make decisions based without touching the patient, or the nurse will go in, do an examination, and the exam will be a surrogate for the other clinicians. And so we're seeing a lot of that. And, um, and I sort of joked to my group, actually, I was talking, I was just informally serving the, the nurses last week when I was in the ICU. I said, are there clinicians that never go in? And they said, absolutely. And so you start thinking about that. You're like, okay, so now every, so if you're going in uh, extubating, you may be the only person in that room for a while. And you have to kind of sort of think through that process. Um, but now that I think we have enough PPE and I think we kind of know more of the biological behavior, hopefully we won't see as much of that issue, of, of, of that as an issue. That is still a concern though. Um, and then the post extubation monitoring has been easy. Like I'll literally, and I'm on the ICU, I'm not, I may not go in like I used to. I may not sort of go in and coach Mr. Smith after we extubate him. I may sort of peek through the window, give him a thumbs up sign or hop on the tele ICU camera and give him a thumb, talk to him there. Um, but it's really interesting to watch our monitoring has changed. And so um, it's been an interesting journey. And then what do you have to reintubate? Like you have to not only have backup intubation equipment near, nearby, but you also have to make sure that, that the equipment has you the right filters, that you have the ventilators, that we leave it an, an extra day or so off, typically to kind of keep it in the room as much as possible. We got to make sure PPE is nearby, that we I make sure I have my PAPR right on the unit. Um, so I can put it on pretty quickly if I need to go in. 
Um, and you just have to really hyper communicate. Um, so COVID-19 has changed it. Now in the trauma world, many of you are already kind of used to that. You're sort of, um, I'll never forget one of my first failed airways was actually in a patient with a, with, with a when I was, a, I was a first year fellow, I'll never forget. We had someone that was a trauma patient in the neuro ICU and three teams, an ENT doc, uh, anesthesiologist, and our team was extubating this patient, and the patient we could not get the airway back in. It was after after a, um, a motor vehicle accident with a, with a cervical halo, and I forgot the extent of injuries. But I remember, never, you never forget that that basically, when you're going to uh, extubate a high risk patient, you really want to hyper communicate. Um, and then we have a protocol at Atrium Health, which is you know. There's lots of protocols out there. There's one in the textbook, which the Vanderbilt team uses. Um, there's other ones out there that are equally good. I mean, you have to kind of pick one and then hopefully stick with it and refine it. Like we have over the last you know five, six years now, I think we've gotten a good handle of it. And it's nothing magical about this. Um, uh, it's just basically um, common sense and being more importantly systematic and almost approaching it like a checklist and standard. Um, the choice of sedation, the C part is easy, uh, is, is, is sort of is, is interesting. So we sort of said, you know, we need a sedation scale. And there's a few sedation scales out there. And we had to make sure that every hospital with all its new nurses and new trainees and, and graduates and such, and all the sort of ICU people that are floaters and such had a single scale. So we picked one scale that we liked. Um, there's another scale that obviously competes with this, um, but we like it. Um, and then we had to sort of figure out how we're going to do it and base all our order sets around it. So I make my trainees learn, memorize this scale every day. One of the things we don't do systematically, and I'm, I've been equally guilty myself, is we don't actually sort of quantify the scale on rounds. And we say, today, Mr. Smith is, is a RAS minus two um, this morning on rounds, but I'll tell you, last night he was a plus two. Um, and the goal today, by the end of the rounds, I should be like, well, today we're going to try for move, move towards extubation soon. So let's go for a zero to plus one today and define the goal and define that. And then everyone that team should know what that means. So hopefully we can all speak the same language because right now the ICU is full of different languages. We all speak different things. We leave different acronyms in their charts. We all talk differently. So we're trying to sort of simplify that language for all of us. Um, it's not been an easy journey. Um, and it's been interesting, particularly with the ER and the ICU communication, because the ER uses GCS a lot. The Glasgow Coma Scale is so easy, it's nice, it's universal, but how does that translate to the RAS? And so when you sort of get that ED to critical care transport to ICU communication, you can see a lot of miscommunication because someone's using the, well, someone, Mr. Smith with a GCS of eight, well, what is that a RAS score of? And I have to kind of do a mental thing, I have to kind of backtrack a little bit to understand their sedation needs and goals uh, back back and forth a little bit. So I encourage you all to kind of talk about how you communicate and pay attention to how you communicate. Um, and we have order sets because what we find is, you know, it's I like the easy button. I mean, I, people look in the EMR and people get overwhelmed by EMR. But honestly, what I get overwhelmed by is adjusting every single order. I really am not a big fan of this. And behavioral psychology will tell you that actually I'm probably – um, more right than other people because I think we make a lot of error when we sort of customize things too much. You want to have general generic order sets that actually allow some flexibility to the nurse at the bedside to do some stuff. Um, obviously, there's some rules here you have to play by, including the JCO rules, the CMS rules and such, and your own institutional rules regarding sort of what flexibility you have. But I I've been, I've been blessed that at, at least at Carolina Medical Center, we have phenomenal critical care pharmacists who really helped drive this process of how to properly get our, our analgesia and sedation order sets coupled together. And we're going to continue to modify this. I think one thing that COVID-19 has taught us is that this is not enough. COVID-19 has humbled us in regards to not just the, the degree of delirium, the prolonged and complex needs of sedation, the needs for new medication, like more, more cocktails. We're making cocktails with ketamine now. Um, drug shortages have forced us, are forced our hands to potentially alter our strategy altogether. And so these order sets that we had are a little bit more challenging now than they have been. Uh, but that being said, for the general population, though, I'm really trying to get our, you know, our rural, pa our rural uh, facility patients more systematized on these, uh, on these practices. And it's, I'll tell you, it's still a struggle. 
Many people are just on propofol alone with no analgesia. Many people were just on analgesia and 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 uh, and benzodiazepine drips. And so we're seeing a lot of variants here. And I'm trying to get people. We're, we're, the ice liberation committee is trying very hard for the Society of Critical Care Medicine to really pay attention to this piece because this adds a lot to the patient's length of stay and complication risks. Um, this is just sort of a, a sort of a, a sedation strategy. If you're going to do an SAT, SBT, what do you do with sedation? Generally, if the patient passes a safety screen, you want to go to half the doses of continuous infusions. I will tell you that this was kind of how I was taught, was time tested. But in COVID-19, I really don't know what the heck to do anymore um, because of the really high needs, the tachyphylaxis that you get with the with, with the narcotics, the high needs there. I mean, we're using enteral and IV routes for some of these patients. We're using um, all kinds of drugs that honestly, I don't use a ton of um, in my my day-to-day -day practice, um, especially in, in, dose, in dose formulations I'm not used to. So um, I, I normally, the pharmacists on the call who are on there know that I call them all the time. I mean, I'm constantly meeting the critical care pharmacists because I think I know this literature okay, but and I struggle and we're gonna cost, if so I'm on call on the weekend and you're a critical care pharmacist, expect a call, phone call from me because I, I really struggle here. Particularly with our ECMO patients, some of the, some of the uh, or dialysis patients, um, if they end up with those, with those means of elimination, then I end up really understand, trying to understand the, the pharmacology and it's really challenging for me. Um, but we do want to do one thing, which is make sure we system systematically communicate, and we're trying to build a better EMR system within our uh, within our health system. I think we're hopefully we'll scale it, and the Society of Critical Care Medicine is doing this through different systems already, trying to figure out what does a nursing workflow look like, what does respiratory therapy workflow look like, what's a clinician workflow look like, so that, that way they can get a better sort of shared communication across the different disciplines. Um, and. This brings us to delirium. And so delirium we know is associated with prolonged duration of mechanical ventilation, longer length of stay, hospital costs, and mortality. And so we're trying to really pay attention to uh, uh, assessing delirium through what we call the ICDSC's R checklist. There's another checklist called the CAM ICU. Just pick one and whatever works for you and then stick with it. I will tell you there's a lot of variability in the charting here of our of day to day and temporal charting issues. But find a scale and then stick with it. For those who rounded with me before, you know I will literally hound and uh, keep the scales up on my cart and my little um, workstation on wheels and basically keep that cart out there and make sure there's any question, I'll make sure I'll calculate in front of the staff right there what the scale is. It takes like five seconds to calculate this. Um, not five, I should say 30 seconds to do it right. But uh, that being said, it can be, if you continue to do it, you get, you get faster at it. And for sake of time, I'm going to keep going, but the delirium scores are meant to sort of systematize the attention to this. Not so much to do what I did back in the day when we were residents, we were taught to give Haldol and we would routinely give 5, 10, 15, 20 milligrams of IV Haldol on any given call night and in, in sequence. And so that's how we were taught to do this stuff and realize that, you know, we probably prolong a lot of QT intervals. Um, so we're, our goal focus now is not the pharmacological management, actually, which turns out it doesn't work as well. It's more the prevention. So how do you prevent delirium? Uh, first, we got to recognize it and sort of think through the scales. And then the second thing is sort of thinking about what's driving it and trying to get the underlying cause. This is one called the, called the think mnemonic. There's a stop mnemonic. There's also a Dr. Dre mnemonic, which I like better. But um, for this, I had to happen to have this slide ready. Um, but what's hard with the COVID-19 population in delirium is the virus itself may be uh, neuropathic. And so the idea that it induces delirium by itself, certain populations, the elderly are more susceptible to COVID-19, the less mobile, the more multiple comorbidities, as you all know. So now you have delirium, a virus that causes delirium, and now the population that's more susceptible to that. And this prolonged ARDS, I mean, I can tell you, this has scared me quite a bit um, about how much they require deep sedation and paralytics, prolonged paralytics. Medications are complicated. They have all kinds of catheters, lines, tubes. And in one week in the ICU last month, I think I put in more chest tubes than I had the entire last year in the ICU, um, just because they have so many pneumothoraces from the, the, the disease process and such. Um, and then what's really hard is that we know certain things work in delirium prevention and management. Family involvement. Well, family's not involved um, with the current visitor restrictions. Glasses and hearing aids may not be available. And you, I mean, the patients are masked or they may be sort of like in a situation where they can't 
can't find their glasses, can't use their hearing aids. And then the team-based care is less existent and partly for our own fears that there's so much virtual care. And so you end up potentially, we're probably part of the problem here. And so it's really hard to overcome this. We do have a couple of things we've tried to do, which is basically uh, what we call our, del our delirium protocol, which many of our staff have really worked hard, tirelessly to, to make this happen. Some of our surgeons were forgiving that we are not doing blood labs at two in the morning. We're actually waiting till six in the morning to do them so that the patients can hopefully sleep. We're not doing nocturnal bats anymore to minimize that nocturnal disruption. So we're trying to do all these things as, as a healthcare system, but it's still, you know, some areas that we can do better at. And then obviously early mobilization. And that's something that, um, you know, many ICUs around the country, depending on where you're working, are having a really hard time with physical therapy staffing and making sure that the physical therapists are mobilizing patients because of our own fears. And we don't want to, we don't have places for them to go. We keep them in the rooms. We don't want patients with COVID-19 potentially can go wander the halls, for example. Um, and so that's changed how we approach physical therapy. So we've not been as robust as we want to be, um, which is also adding to, adding to the delirium, adding to prolonged ICU care and such. And so we're learning a lot in this process. And particularly what we're learning is we missed the old days uh, pretty quickly. And so, um, but this is something that you probably see, well, you probably are seeing already. Oh. Um, early mobility, I'm not going to bother you with more uh, sort of details on this. The one thing I do want to talk about is family engagement. I highlight, and I mentioned this earlier, is that the family, the family in the ICU, I thought we were making a lot of progress in family engagement and critical care with the idea that eventually our future state would be families would round with us. And I think, and I've, I've done that many times for those who know, I love it. It saves me a lot of calling back later. It builds trust. It does a lot of good things if it's properly um, sort of um, massaged or probably, probably scaled. But now family is no longer available. I mean, we had uh, our own family members actually were in the ICU from COVID-19 and from other injuries. My brother-in-law just had a cholecystectomy or acutely two days ago and he's alone. And so, and families are alone and it's a very tough environment. So still learning this piece and trying to figure out how to make this better. Um, we're still trying to become checklist oriented. So this is one checklist that you might see, but it, basically the idea that uh, we want to be, we want to hold our rounds to standards of making sure that we hit the high points. Um, but not, we're trying to go away from paper and put everything through the EMR. So on the left side is this EPIC screenshot. So the EPIC group is making ICE liberation uh, tools within the EPIC system. The right is the current Cerner tool, but that's going to evolve also. So both EPIC and Cerner were the two biggest systems, but there are other, other systems also trying to figure out how do we actually make it with a nursing documentation. You can see on the left here, you can, you can sort of chart, chart how this patient sedation scale goes and then what the target looks like. And you can kind of start to see how this aligns in some shape or form. And, the, and then we have a separate page in the canopy toolbox, but um, we're moving to a different system soon. And in a trauma population, sort of is ICU liberation different? And so this, uh, uh, Jennifer Sweeney in Florida, I'm, I think she's at Florida Hospital, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so look at the trauma ICU population and, figure, and trying to figure out how does ICU liberation work? It was kind of designed for many, and it was in, formulated in many, in many medical ICUs and mixed med surge ICUs. And how does it work in a po trauma population? And what she found a couple of things is that actually the trauma population, the, the, the nurses and the staff do a better job with pain assessments and certain things. But she did find there's a lot of variability. And in the conclusion, she said a couple of things was, one of the things she realized was there's a lot of variability in delirium screening and, sc and scoring. And so you're only as good as your data, essentially, is what she was kind of came to the conclusion uh, about. Family member participation was less uh, in the trauma population. And that the um, basically the bundle documentation was poor across different ICUs. And so she's trying to sort of think through the space. And she has a very nice paper about this, about why it might be a little bit different in the population. And I think it mirrors what a lot of my surgeons tell me around the country who basically say that the, that the checklist works well in the trauma ICU, but there is some subjective training, some, some subjective differences in some of the scoring, and that um, there's some inconsistent application of some of the principles. But that's probably better than our medical ICU is doing it in a lot, in a lot of places also. Um, so I want to try to end this talk with enough, feel free, a few minutes for, for questions. Um, I think we're done at 1.30 if I'm correct, Scott. Um, but that ICU liberation works. COVID-19 is challenging a lot of this. And a lot of us believe that, you know, the ICU liberation as challenging as it is right now is probably even more important for our med medical ICU patients with COVID-19 because they are having very, very long stays. 
Um, and um, it's something that, I mean, we're not used to seeing this anymore. This is stuff like we did when I was a medical student and resident. Uh, we had these patients that would stay in the ICU for months. And honestly, with all the sepsis protocols and early resuscitation efforts and things like that, we've gotten much better at as a society and as a country. A lot has taken a step backwards with this, pop with this virus. And so we're starting to see a lot of challenges come to the forefront. But we think it's even more important now that we pay attention to delirium prevention ass assessment, assessment of sedation scores, daily attention to all this stuff. Um, and that the trauma population might have some nuances, but that you got to stick with it and kind of keep going at it because I think it works. And from a dose response system, from a dose response uh, uh, effect, I think ICU liberation is worth the effort. Um, so um, I have time for a few minutes for questions. Dr. Singh, thank you very much for a, an excellent lecture as always. Uh, this is Kyle Cunningham. I had a quick question for you on uh, your um, protocols and general practices right now with your COVID patients. Uh, in the trauma setting, we uh, for years have been going, uh, or at least trending more towards uh, early tracheostomy for you know yeah. certain patient populations that we know are going to be a more difficult uh, wean and difficult to liberate from the ICU, namely spinal cord patients, uh, severe TBI. Uh, and, uh, you know, we found that we we make a lot of inroads by getting an early trach in these patients uh, because we require decreased sedation over this time. Uh, they tend to be easier to care for. Um, they have, certainly have a lot more comfort. Um, you know, families report some feedback of uh, some benefit. Uh, and I was wondering, um, you know, early on, we were very hesitant to do any procedures on uh, COVID positive patients. And it seems like we are trending kind of in the opposite direction with these long ICU stays that we're uh, we are tra uh, performing tracheostomy much earlier. And I, I was wondering from from your perspective, if you're seeing that uh, is a developing trend and if you're seeing any detriments or um, uh, or any benefit uh, to this. Great question. So yeah, we went back and forth on this quite a bit in every facet. I think early on in the pandemic, we didn't know like, do we have will we have enough PPE? Are the PPEs that we're using safe? Is it going to be in enough supply? And so we had to do a little bit of self-preservation, if you will, to figure out, you know, do we really want to risk ourselves, especially if we're in a workforce shortage? Um, do we want our our clinicians going down, trying to do things that we can prolong potentially or delay? So early on, I think a lot of us, whether it be tracheostomy or other invasive procedures, were kind of like hesitant to do a lot of stuff. I think since then, a lot of, there's been a lot of shift um, in the what is an acceptable risk um, and what is an acceptable uh, sort of situation by which to do a procedure, an invasive procedure like a tracheostomy, which by its inherent nature is a higher risk situation. So a couple of things you can do, and I think there's several guidelines now that are out there from the ENT society, from the surgical societies, from the critical care society, and the bronchoscopic society. Um, so there's at least four guidelines that I'm aware of um, on tracheostomy, and there's some minor variances, but I think more of them are shifting towards a lot, not having this, you know, three week or four week minimum minimum uh, sort of clearance time for the virus to kind of come through. I think more of us are feeling more comfortable with our PPE. Um, and we're feeling more comfortable at how we manage sort of things besides the PPE. There's other things you can do, whether it be breath holds, whether it be sort of other maneuvers you can do to potentially minimize the aerosol generating time to minimize total viral viral exposure. We're finding that's helpful. I agree with you that early, my bias is early tracheostomy in a lot of these patients. Um, but that being said, I don't want my surgeon to get sick, you know, and so uh, in doing these pop, these pop, these, these, um, these procedures, so I'm, I'm not going to sort of die in the vine to sort of say that you need to do this. Um, and I think it's a negotiation. It's a constant assessment. And honestly, I made my surgeons do a couple of tracheostomies that I don't even know the patients are going to survive even after a tracheostomy. So why do we go through all that risk to a patient that may not even survive this, this illness? So I don't know. I don't know the answer to this. Um, I think a lot of us are thinking through this. Um, I think a lot of, this, of, of us are still learning. Um, I would encourage you, if you think someone's survivable, to actually advocate for, uh, like, um, like, I would encourage earlier tracheostomy, but that's just me speaking out of turn. Um, and I don't know, I don't need data to back that up uh, with this situation. I think um, I, I would be curious what the surgeons are, are thinking about, because I don't want them to go home to their families and members and think that, oh my gosh, I'm the one who brought home, you know, a virus on a patient that I didn't need to trach immediately. I could have waited a little longer and such. And so we, we respect those fears. I hope that answers your question, 
because uh, I don't know the answer. Bottom line is I don't know. It's a long-winded way of saying I don't know the answer. It, yeah, yeah uh, thank you. No no, thanks for your insight on this. And it, you know, it, it's interesting because I, I think you and I sh share a lot of the same feelings. That, you know, we, we've discussed this uh, in the past, although I think it's been quite a while since we've discussed it. That uh, it, it is a bit of a, a gray area, and you know, seeing that benefit, knowing that we have that benefit in certain populations, and then uh, you know, trying to extrapolate that out, uh, clearly weighing the risk. Um, it, I think what we come back to with our group a lot of times is that it's a very personal decision for the you know for the the surgeon uh, in the group so um but again i i, I would agree with you that the a more in-depth discussion of the you know but the particular case and the risks and benefits for those those uh patients are very important we're kind of taking this on a case-by-case -case basis right now i think it's a good way of doing it to be honest with you i think if you're not doing it on a case to case by case basis then you aren't paying attention to the very complex needs you're not humble enough to know that none of us really have the answers here that's really yeah. challenging The other thing I think, uh, the other lesson that I think is here is, is I really miss having a pharmacist all the time around. I got my beck and call. I think it's one of those things where I, I, I think you get, we get spoiled. And hope for those of you on the call who actually have already access to critical care pharmacists all the time, who work, live and breathe this world, that's awesome. I mean, I'm really jealous of that. And I really feel like that's a something that the pandemic has really heightened is our attention to our sort of, we take for granted disciplines that have really sort of shown shine a light on things that are really like that, that we really need um whether it be infected and, and in our case id specialists with the pandemic um who have really taken the taken a, a huge amount of work on their shoulders related to the population um obviously the bedside clinicians the nurses and others who've done a lot of work but i think the pharmacists i mean when we early on the pandemic we sort of had the pharmacists do working remotely and um, and not really engaged in team rounds. And I think it really showed that we didn't have them all the time uh, rounding with them, making plans. And these comp and these things are so complicated. These disease states are so complicated. Um, sedation strategies and analgesia strategies are so complicated um, that uh, honestly, I kind of missed that piece. And I think it's highlighted the deficiencies in many ICUs when you don't have those elements, how much you need them. Hey, Jasper, it's uh, Cindy Lauer. I have a, um, I just wanted to say thanks for a great talk, but also to highlight on one of the points that you had made and get your opinion. I feel like, um, you know, we've spent years progressing um, critical care into this multidisciplinary thing and incorporating families. And I, and I agree with you. I think that COVID has kind of derailed everything um, and really, um, taken critical care rounds and kind of our processes back, you know, for years. Um, I just wondered what your thoughts were. How do we get back on track and how do we get back to where we where we started, knowing that this isn't going to get better soon? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I think I'll, I, I sort of stay, stay up awake at, awake at night thinking about that. You know, every family member I have, it just like, it just breaks your heart to watch some of these um, sort of family interactions and talking to people virtually, it's just not satisfying. Um, I'm a huge advocate for virtual care, as you know, but there's limits. And, um, and um, I think the best way is to sort of step back. It does give us a chance to step back and I think we take for granted a lot of things. Um, protocols, processes, team-based care, how we communicate, um, including what are some of the plus signs sides here? I'll tell you one of the plus sides has been how people have really, you know, as much as we might have Zoom fatigue, I'll tell you Teams or Zoom or other sort of similar situations, now we can actually communicate. Like here I am giving a, a rounds in my, in, my, in my conference, some of you are at your offices, some of you are having lunch. And so you're not have, you have access to information in a different sort of scale and speed and convenience that we didn't have before. So can we use that potentially to... Um, help us get knowledge at the forefront quickly. And so I think there's a lot of people and teams interested in this piece. Um, so how do we get back? So we have to define what is the what is the value added for every element of the workflow? What's a normal workflow? Um, and with the pandemic being prolonged, um, should we modify that to hit the high points? Um, and so I can, there are different people, people looking at this from different angles, including some using the tele-ICU as, as a nexus other systems looking at sort of iPad-based team communication systems, potentially. The EMR vendors are looking at potentially, can we create like a systemic, systematic um, communication portal um, that people can use? 
And so I think you're going to see out of this sort of out, out of out of this sort of um, dilemma, I think you're going to see some really creative solutions of how we involve families, how we take care of some of the knowledge, how, how do we get expertise at the bedside at the point of interest, rather than a scheduled rounding time per se that may be convenient for the physicians. I think you're going to see some new new solutions here, and I'm I'm very interested in some of the publications coming out regarding this. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, one of the things to highlight that a little bit, I think one of the things that sort of like, you know, some Vanderbilt's, the Wake Forest have published about the um, ICU liberation, um, sorry, the um, ICU survival clinics. And everyone talks about how great this is. To me, that thing should be virtual. I mean, my patients end up in all kinds of ICUs around the country or, or L, L, I mean, in the region, the LTACs, nursing homes, uh, God knows where. And so why not use the, what we learn virtually to figure out, can we do a virtual I, um, ICU survivalship clinic? I mean, to me, that's a very easily constructible um, concept now that doesn't rely on space or transportation or limitations. And so you start thinking about sort of solution that you can readily, at, readily implement. That's one that just comes to mind. And so that would be kind of cool. Can I figure out other ways to get families involved? I mean, I did a whole virtual clinic this morning. Um, so I saw none of my patients came to the office today. They all were seen virtually in their homes because they all have frail lungs or other issues. And so I'm like, well, why can't I do that for other things in the ICU? Um, and so we started thinking through that space a little bit. I think we're going to see some things come back, come out of this that may be sustainable. This is Susan Evans. I just wanted to um, make a comment that um, that th th these questions were, are timely because we just submitted a program proposal to for SCCM to talk about the F in the liberation bundle um, in a pandemic and um, are aiming to do it as a crosstalk. So um, discussion on the pitfalls of that, but also some potential solutions. So Dr. Lauer, I'm going to put you on the uh, on the panel so that we can get some good discussion going. That's awesome. Cool. Well, thanks so much, everybody, for having me on. Thank you so much for saying this was Thank an you. incredible lecture. Um, and so we would greatly appreciate your expertise and your time on this. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Yeah, thanks, Jess Ball. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.